professional topics tonight has been a problem. But thank you all for being here. My name is Patrice Franco, and as the director of the Goldfarb Center, I am very proud and honored to have Oliver Sabat with us tonight. Given that Oliver's talk will be in large part biographical, I didn't want to steal a story. I would like, therefore, to add a few things about Oliver that he may not say about himself, because one of his defining characteristics is modesty. Oliver is very smart, but so are lots of people. I remember him in my Latin American economics class as a student who not only had control of facts, but was able to put them in the service of a sound, creative idea. His work always comes from the heart. When I stole him from my husband, Sandy Maisel, as Oliver began as a student of American politics, he was very clear that his personal principles were to help people. As I believe you may share, this characteristic of caring deeply was both a strength and a limitation in development work. I remember hearing about the death all around him in a community afflicted by AIDS, and how when such moments as when a child was happy that there was a funeral because the child would have a meal, catapulted Oliver into deep depression. Oliver feels things deeply, this is both a motivator and an impediment to change. Oliver is a risk taker. He is willing to go all in for the big idea. Only someone with Oliver's compassion and grit could say, as he did when he was working for the Clinton Health Initiative, that his job was to eradicate malaria. <laughs> Oliver learns from his missteps, deeply <coughs> reflective. It is only someone who is open to changing himself that has a chance of making change in this world. Yes, like others, Oliver is very smart, but he's a special smart, the kind who knows people, including himself, that soars with a vision, but is also able to press the button of reflect and reset. I look forward to hearing from him today on the contours of his journey in development. I know we will all be better for it. So please join me in welcoming Oliver back to Colby. All right. Thank you, Patrice. Uh, 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 yeah. yeah, I don't want to uh, destroy your ears. Uh, yeah, great to have all you here. Uh, Thanks so much for joining on a Thursday evening. Um, I, uh, I've been an educator in some form or another for the past 16 years, and uh, one thing that is important to me as an educator is the process of active learning rather than just passively listening. So uh, I'll spend a little bit of time talking at you, but I want to try to, as much as possible, uh, engage you guys as well, um, so that it's uh, it's not just one way. So why don't we kick off uh, with a show of hands. Um, who here has a vision of themselves at some point in your life, now, five years from now, 10 years from now, as a leader? Not you, Sydney? <laughs> <laughs> Who here has a vision of themselves as an entrepreneur? Building something new. Who here has a vision of themselves as a change maker, creating change in the world? Great. I'm really glad to see it. What I expected, it was awesome to hear for those who are at dinner. Um, already what your passions are, what ideas you have, what problems you want to solve. So, I don't know if you've encountered this before, but I'm going to ask you to turn and talk. Which is, turn to your neighbor. If you don't have a neighbor, scoot over so you can find one. If you need to create a three, create a three. 
And I'd like you to discuss for two minutes your aspirations to be a leader, to be an entrepreneur, to be a change maker. What do you think you need to change? How do you need to grow? What do you need to do most to achieve that vision? Two minutes, go. Becoming a leader or a better leader, becoming an entrepreneur, becoming a change maker. Did you have specific people in mind? Did you have archetypes? What's when you think of becoming an entrepreneur, a change maker, who comes to mind? Like MLK, um, Gandhi, Dr. Ambedkar, you know. People. Excellent that start from the bottom and work the way up to fight for build at the bottom. Excellent. Change makers. What about entrepreneurs? Yeah. Paul Farmer. Paul Farmer, yeah. David Nealman. David Nealman. Okay, you have to. Jeff Lohman as well. Oh, gotcha. Excellent. Very good. Very good. Any, other, any other archetypes that came to mind? Ford. Ford. Ah. Jerry or Henry? <laughs> Henry. So, I, you know, when I was leaving Colby, I wish I had that sense of purpose uh, that you had. I had no idea what to do with myself. I had this vague sense that I wanted to be something more than what I was. I wanted to do something in the world but I had no concept of, of what that would be. And then over time, I got this idea that I did, I wanted to be a leader, I wanted to be a change maker, I wanted to be an entrepreneur, and I wanted to follow in the footsteps of those people our society puts forward, particularly today, as the great models of those leaders and entrepreneurs, Jobs, Musk, right? And when I thought about what defines them, thought about vision, thought about the creativity, the willingness and ability to think differently about a problem, and I thought about steel. When you think about the stories we hear about great leaders, entrepreneurs, change makers, we hear about how they faced huge obstacles and they stayed brave, they stayed firm, and they overcame them and they changed the course of history. They had steel, they had strong backbones and they didn't back down, right? You think about MLK or Gandhi, the level of adversity they faced. June 2018, 
I was in a wheelchair in Kenya where I was living at the time. I saw some top doctors in Boston and in London, and I was told that I certainly, though I've all been athletic my whole life, I certainly would never be athletic again, and I'd be lucky if I walked again. June 2019, I climbed Mount Kenya, the second highest mountain in Africa, which is 16,000 feet high, healthy and happy, and completely free of any condition. What happened? What happened in that year between June 2018 and June 2019 that not just got me out of a wheelchair, but got me to the top of one of the highest mountains in the world? So I'm gonna go through the answer to that question with a bit of a, a review of three chapters of my career, three lessons I learned from that, that will answer both that question and the path to realizing our potential as leaders and change makers, <coughs> and most importantly, three failures. So as I said, I came out of Colby and I had absolutely no idea what to do with myself. I spent the summer and had a lot of fun with uh, some of my friends, not wanting to let the experience of living together on this campus end. And then I realized that I probably couldn't just keep doing that, that we couldn't keep pretending we were still uh, pre-graduation at Colby. And so I went around and, and started trying to figure out what to do. And I ended up taking a volunteer placement in Southern Africa as a teacher in Namibia. Southwest Africa, up on the border with Angola, very rural area of the country and the continent. And I got two weeks of training when I arrived in the country to be a teacher, and I got thrown in the back of a pickup truck, and drove 16 hours out to a little village uh, where I lived uh, in a hut with the principal of the school and was given five classes, 60 students each, to teach English and life sciences students aged 13 to 23. Of course, I was 22 at the time. Um, but I had a Colby education, right? I had studied with amazing professors. I'd done OK. I you know, I was at the, been, been told that I was among the sort of pinnacle of the world, right? I'd had a amazing global education. I was constantly given feedback that I was smart and capable and I knew what I was doing. I could teach some kids, right? Um, and certainly in a setting where they had so little to begin with. So I came at it with huge energy, confidence. I would stay up late at night and make these amazing lesson plans. I was you know, outside of my two weeks of teacher training and read up on what was the state of the art in teaching and education theory? And I was going to have these great projects and engaging lessons. I wasn't just going to lecture at them. Come into the classroom and I'd roll out these lessons. And kids weren't really engaged. And you know, a couple of weeks in, and I thought I was designing these amazing, really interesting, engaging lessons. And I just wasn't getting anything back from them. And finally, several weeks in, I was standing at the front of the class of the chalkboard. And I had asked a question after I'd gone through some demonstration. And dead silence. Just, you know, dead silence and slightly blank looks. I mean, they all spoke English. Right? They, they had all. This was a country that changed the official language to English some years earlier. Some had, you know, not, not the best, but they all spoke English. I knew that they spoke English. But they just, they just weren't coming back to me. And I just had this inkling in the back of my mind. And I turned, to, turned back to them and I said, can anyone just repeat what I just said? Dead silence. And finally, this, this brave young man in the back of the room 
raised his hand, and he goes, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> and what I realized is they spoke English perfectly well. They spoke to each other, they spoke to the principal in English, but they couldn't understand a word I was saying because my accent was so strong. I was talking away, and just like I am to you now, perfectly fluent English, but I had such a strong accent, all they heard was the quacking of a duck. Wah, wah, wah. And of course, I have grown up my whole life thinking, I don't have an accent. I'm American, right? I'm not from Boston. I'm from Western Massachusetts. We don't have <laughs> accents in Western Massachusetts, like Bostonians. You know, we don't have an English or an Irish accent. We are the norm. But of course, everyone has an accent, as I learned at that time. And to them, the American accent, our incredibly nasal way of speaking, was incomprehensible. They were so used to a, the, the local accent and the way that the vowels are pronounced there that they couldn't understand me. And that was the beginning of then several months of that experience in which basically my whole view of myself and the world was torn apart. Of which that sense of me and my American accent being the center of the world was just one small bit. My amazing education, all my ability to thrive in the classroom did nothing for me in teaching 60 students five times a day in this country. I taught them next to nothing. All my, my brilliant ideas and my plans, I, I couldn't deliver what they needed. And so I came away from that experience and I, I ended up leaving early. I ended up, I was supposed to, to, to teach longer and I, I basically left that small village in, in tears and depressed because my, my sort of sense of self had been so shattered by this experience. But it was, at that time, the hardest thing that ever happened to me and it was the best thing that ever happened to me and I wouldn't trade it for anything because I needed to be able to grow, to be able to then realize the path that was right for me from there, I needed to have my worldview torn apart. If I continued to think of myself as the center of the world, if I continued to think of my American upbringing as the center of the world, I wouldn't have been able to grow any further. Growth equals uncertainty, growth equals challenge. What I realized at that time is that I had been playing it safe my entire life. One of my greatest regrets of my experience at Colby was that I didn't take very many risks. I took classes that were interesting to me, took classes with great professors who I liked, but there were things that came naturally to me. I always shied away from things that felt more scary or challenging. It wasn't until that experience in that tiny little village that I did something that was totally beyond my ability level. And it was great for me. Because it is only when you push yourself far beyond your limits that you have the capability to grow. And when you play it safe, when I played it safe, I was growing very incrementally. So it was the first big lesson uh, that uh, I had from that first big failure, walking away from that, that uh, first experience in that village. So the second question I would love to you, for you to turn and talk to your neighbor about, um, remind myself of it, yes, what are you certain about at the moment that you should be less certain about? What are you certain about that you should be able to do about? Two minutes ago. I'm 
Because there's a possibility that they do real successful. Yeah, it's possible that like without government being involved, it's easier to get to the more efficient, and it's a more effective use of resources, and that sort of thing, and that you know, accountability is, in the, is factored in, in that the presumably if you were doing harm, the community would not be doing it. Take 30 more seconds. It's a good thing. <laughs> it's going to serve you well. And you should feel so good. Hear one or one or two reflections back. What did, what did you say that you are feeling certain about, but you feel you should be less certain of? I can call. Call. Freya's ready to go. Take her. We kind of talked about just the certainty of like, oh, you go to Colby, you'll be okay in the future. Like, there's that cushion. And it's like, yes, like I'm getting this amazing education. I shouldn't. I don't think it's okay to be that certain mm. about mm. success in the future. You mm. should be propelled by fear. That's what you're saying. <laughs> 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 sort of like something pushing you further to that extra mile. Mm -hmm. Or what? How do you define success? You know, what are you? What are you going to do with that? Yeah. Great. One other. Yeah. Well, um, oh, ever since I'm a junior now, but ever since I got to Colby, I know, well, I say that, but I'm supposed to be uncertain about it, but like, I've been, I want to be a doctor, so I'm specifically a cardiologist, <laughs> um, and so I know, but then throughout my time at Colby, I've done so many different things, and that have like actually gotten my attention and has to do with like a bunch of different things, you know, working with like, um, education aspects of it, policy aspects of it, so maybe I am supposed to be uncertain about it. And mm. so, yeah, you said that so confidently, I know. Do you, do you really? It sounds like maybe you don't fully know, right? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's good. Good. That's, that's okay. Um, so yeah, so this second, second chapter, second lesson, second failure. So after, uh, after leaving the village, I, as Patrice mentioned, I had gotten very galvanized while living there about health, about the AIDS epidemic. It was the peak of the HIV epidemic in Southern Africa, and it was living in an area with, where 25 to 30 percent of people were infected. And, and then you'd go into these tiny villages, and there were only two concrete structures. It would be mostly traditional huts, two concrete structures. One would be what's called a bottle shop, where they would serve beer, and the other was a funeral because even though it was a fairly sparsely populated area, people were dying in such large numbers that you had a business of, of these funeral parlors throughout the country. Uh, and so I spent the next 10 years uh, you know, doing, doing my small part in uh, helping in the response to the global AIDS epidemic, and the malaria, and vaccines, and tuberculosis, and other things, amazing experience, and spent a good chunk of that at the Clinton Health Access Initiative, amazing colleagues, and then I got to a point where that lesson of growth equals challenge was starting itching at the back of my head. Where I was starting to feel like I wasn't growing as much. And the, the phrase that kept going through my head was, I want to scare myself again. I haven't had a good, really good scare since that time living out in, in rural Bolivia. So I left, walked away from the Clinton Foundation, I walked away from global health, and decided that I was now going to pursue this ambition of becoming an entrepreneur, and was very passionate about also getting back to, the, to you know, where I started in education, and we were going to start solutions for the uh, youth employment crisis 
in Africa. So as you may know, in 2030, basically 10 years from now, there will be more young people entering the workforce every year across Africa than the rest of the world combined. So that's US, China, India, all of Latin America, all of Europe. We have more young people than all those places combined. And it's a, uh, both an opportunity and a threat of not quite the scale of climate change, but it is a threat of a massive magnitude that very people, few people think about or understand. Think about that these countries and systems are already overwhelmed and strained, now having tens of millions of more young people, but very little prospect for work, for uh, thriving, and what's going to happen to societies, and, and then rippling out from those countries if we don't solve them. So we got together with some, some great co-founders, and we came up with these ideas of how we were going to contribute to, to solving this. And co-founders also you know, extremely smart, well-educated, law degrees from Yale, and medical degrees, and so forth. And so we, we start sitting together, and we design these amazing plans. We use it months and months, and we come up with all these clever ideas of how we're going to build these programs that are going to, um, to, to provide young people, first in Kenya and then out throughout the con uh, continent, with the skills they need, with the connections with employers, and they're going to um, transition into employment so much faster, and they're going to be much better contributors to companies, and grow the companies, and create jobs, it's going to be amazing. And so we uh, move, move to Kenya, and we start <coughs> we, we, we convince uh, investors of this story, and everyone's giving us this feedback, it's amazing, brilliant, this is great, and we start doing these things, spending the money, and uh, we get to design this, this really clever, amazing curriculum, we hire a great team, and we start running these programs, and we get you know, a range of students and their families to show up, and they don't come back. We do it again, and you know, a range of students and families show up, and then they don't come back again. And we, we don't understand it first because you know, we had, you know, we talked to all the experts in the world, we put you know, a huge amount of thought and analysis into it. There's, there, there's nothing that looked like it should be wrong at surface, and yet people weren't coming. And it took us you know, a couple of, of months of realization that it didn't matter how smart and clever and well presented these things that we had built were, people didn't want them. This is not what families in Kenya wanted, and they were voting with their feet. And we had seen that. We should have seen it. You know, we had sat down with these families right when we got started before we started spending lots of money, and we talked to them, and they told us this. They told us what they were interested in, what they needed, what they wanted, but we didn't listen. We were so wrapped up in how clever we were, we were so wrapped up in ourselves as the experts, that we weren't actually able to really hear what they were saying. We thought we heard what they were saying. Of course, we thought we were listening, but it got filtered through the lens of our arrogance, that we ultimately knew the answer, that we were smarter than them. And that, so we were picking, that's what we all do, walking around all the time as, as humans, we take lots of data, and we pick out the bits that fit the narratives of ourselves that we have going on in our heads. And so we're picking the bits that we like, that fit the narrative we had about what we were doing and who we were, and leaving the rest aside. And it just happened that the bits that we picked were wrong. And the, the, the bits that we left aside were what we needed to be hearing. Arrogance and certainty are the death of growth. We have to stay in if we want to grow and create change and create anything great in the world. The, every time that I have found myself getting arrogant, I found myself getting certain of things, certain of myself, 
and ended up falling on my face in some way. And uh, doing something that is you know, led to failure or, or hurting people. So that's the second lesson of trying to stay within uncertainty as much as possible. Last question for you. What's breaking your heart right now? What's breaking your heart right now? Turn and talk two minutes. <coughs> And so, like, because you can't control, like, their actions or, like, um, the things that they're doing, it's kind of heartbreaking when they um, do things that you s perceive as bad. You empathize, you want to help them. Yeah. Exactly. <coughs> Ultimately, it's their life, their choices. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, we talked about a lot of injustices and global conflict. So I said the errors are, like, conflict is, like, mm -hmm. constantly on my mind. And we were talking about criminal justice and... Um, a lot of different things she's like, whatever, I don't want to speak for you, but yeah, so. Excellent. Excellent. Do you want a dollar back? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just not, um, I was just reading about the school shootings, or mm. did that happen today? Uh -huh. And yeah, there aren't really words to express that. Yeah. So, to sort of come back to where we started, talked about how you know, as I got into my career, I developed this aspiration that I wanted to be a great leader. I wanted to be a great entrepreneur. I wanted to be a Jobs. I wanted to be a Musk. I wasn't probably going to invent a new iPhone or SpaceX, but I wanted to be in that mold. And so as I said, we uh, we launched this uh, new employment program in Kenya, and it wasn't working. And so from the ashes of that, tried to take what lessons we could, and more humbly, embracing the humility of it, we started a new venture there. And this one was schools. It was everything that we had learned about how to solve the employment crisis was that ultimately what employers wanted and needed and therefore what young people wanted and needed was critical thinking, creativity, strength of character, ability to communicate. These are not things that are easy to teach in a few weeks when someone's 22. 
These are things that you build over many years in which everyone on the planet should be getting in their basic education. And there were tens of millions of young people throughout the continent who were parents were spending a huge amount of money and energy to send them into 12 or 14 years of basic education and they were coming out with none of that. In Kenya, parents spend 55% of their disposable income on their kids' education. Think about that. Think about spending 55% of your income on your kids' education. They're so deeply devoted to their kids' education. I've never been anywhere in the world where there people will go to such lengths to find educational opportunity for their kids, and yet most schools are turning around and giving them nothing in return. So we decided we're gonna launch a network of schools, vision of, of 100 great schools across the continent that are delivering best in world education, critical thinking, creativity within local African education systems at a cost that's affordable to many more families. We get going and we open first school and then second school, and soon 10 schools. And it's really hard. There is challenge and setback and crisis after crisis after crisis. Our first school, two months before school opened, had hundreds of students enrolled and we had a classroom building. We had to somehow put classrooms up in less than two months. Our second school, a girls boarding high school, a week before school opened and we didn't have a dormitory. I mean, 150 girls were coming to live there. We didn't have anywhere from them to live uh, in a week. We had, uh, we had crisis after crisis. We had not one, not two, not three, not four, at least five times when we were weeks away from running out of money. During the dinner, someone asked about, well, what do you do if you're trying new things? And if you fail, it impacts people. And we had moment after moment where we had thousands of students who were relying on us to get their education out. We're going to school, and we had hundreds of people we employed. The team is now 700 people. We had thousands and thousands and thousands of parents who stood in front of and said, yes, we know this is new, believe us, we are going to do the right thing by your children. And it was about time, we were about time to shut it all down, because we are about to run out of money. And in our First school, there uh, was a desk, a small desk that outside the principal's office. And uh, particularly in the when we were opening our first schools, I, I was trying to be active, trying to be everywhere I could at all times in the schools. So I tried to be in classrooms a lot, I tried to be engaging in teams a lot. So I didn't sit down very often. I was sort of 14 hours a day, a lot of running around on my feet. But of course, sometimes I had to find a quiet moment and sit down at my desk and try to catch up uh, on work on my computer. And it was at that desk when someone sitting there, someone came up to me and said, the ceiling of the old dormitory building you decided to have us lease collapsed on a teacher last night when he was sleeping. I was sitting at that desk when an angry father came storming in and accused us of abusing his daughter and summoned and presented us with a summons to go in front of the high court. Because when I was sitting at that desk when I got the call that my brother had attempted suicide and blamed me for being halfway around the world and not at home supporting him and my mother. Again and again and again I was presented with these hugely challenging, shattering moments. But I'm supposed to be steel, right? That's what Jobs does. That's what Musk does. That's what MLK does. And so throughout all of it, to our team, to my family, I presented a placid face. I showed that I can lead through this. I presented steel. But the problem is, I'm not steel. We're not steel. 
I'm human. And so even though outwardly, and even to myself inwardly, I didn't show that I was feeling anything from all of this, somewhere in some corner in the back of my mind, I was howling with fear and rage and shame at everything that I was facing. And it built and it built over time, and eventually, my mind couldn't handle it anymore. The constant repression of the feeling in my body started to shut down, and I developed two chronic health conditions, and ended up in a wheelchair, as I said. And how, as I asked at the start, did I get back out of it? It's simply as I allowed myself to feel it. There's a saying that neurologists and psychologists use now, which is, you either feel it or you live it. If you look at the opioid epidemic, if you look at other forms of addiction, if you look at suicide, depression, there's an article in the New York Times the other day about rise in self-harm. And they describe it as self-harm as a outlet of physical pain being so much simpler than emotional pain. It's clear. That's effectively what I was doing to myself. It was so much simpler to have searing pain in my life, grappling with this hugely complex, scary pain of day after day feeling this responsibility for thousands and thousands of young people and not knowing if I could do it. And knowing that if I failed, that I was going to have a huge impact on these young people's lives. That the sacrifice I was making by choosing to do that and serve those young people who I felt like I was letting down on a daily basis so that I get sued and taken in front of the high court, I was letting my mother decline and die from Alzheimer's and having my brother blame it on me. I just couldn't process all of it. And as a result, my body was shutting down. And then I had to do this hard work I call the most important part of leadership, the art of being human. I had to actually learn how to feel the negative feelings. I had to learn how to feel that fear of what would happen if I did allow us to run out of money or didn't complete that classroom building out of time. I had to feel the anger at our investors for pulling the money at the last minute and putting me in that situation, or the anger at that father for suing us and being unreasonable when we were trying to do the right thing by his daughter, or the shame I felt at leaving my mother sick halfway across the other side of the world. And when I did, I got better. And within a few months, I was running a half marathon. I put up on the board here what has become sort of anthem for my life and my work now, and what I believe is truly at the core of great leadership. Because the nature of the way we tell stories in our culture and society is we only take a thin slice of what's really going on. We don't know what's going on within the heads and within the lives of these people we put up on pedestals, but there's a lot more going on. And the reality is that we all are affected by this core human equation Suffering equals P times R. Suffering equals pain times resistance. The world is a heartbreaking place. There are terrible things happening across the world, around us, every day, whether it's the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, whether it's school shootings, whether it's criminal justice, whether it's just a friend who's in pain and struggling and want to, but we can't help them. And we have one choice. We can't change that pain in the world. Even if we go out and we do great work, and we contribute and we have impact, there's always going to be more pain. There's going to be more pain around in society, and there's going to be more pain in our own lives. Our friends are going to get sick, our 
family members are going to die. The one choice we have is we can either resist it or we can embrace it. We can try to push away the heartbreak and pretend it's not there and not let, us affect, let it affect us, or we can lean in and allow ourselves to be heartbroken. Allow ourselves to be heartbroken, but in a way that it doesn't overwhelm us and it doesn't stop us from doing the things that we want to do. It doesn't stop us from living a great life. It doesn't stop us from going out and continuing to try to help as best we can. So instead of leaders being made of steel, I now believe that the great leaders are human, the great leaders are vulnerable, and the great leaders are wholeheartedly broken hearted. Thank you. So we have about 15 minutes for questions. And we do ask that you use the microphone, not that we can't hear each other, but thanks to Alex, we're taping this so that others who aren't in the room can also be part of the conversation. More phone calls? <laughs> yeah. Um, sweet. <laughs> um, so I'm in this really strange, oh god, wow. I feel like I don't need this, but I'm, I'll take it anyway. Um, I feel like I'm in this really strange place where I'm in a similar position. I, I want to change um, the quality of people's lives, um, whether that be international and domestic. Uh, but I feel this like strange, um, I don't even know, like, I don't know how to characterize it, like this, the idea of going abroad to change people's lives there versus like ch changing things in my, not, even, not exactly my community, but right next door. Um, on some levels, like I think of it as unethical, but on other levels, like the, the neighborhood next door has clean water, right? And like in, in certain communities around the world, they don't, they don't have simple access to things that would make, that would, I mean, just like the returns on, on providing basic things in different places is just, um, so from an economic standpoint, <laughs> thank you, Patrice, <laughs> it makes a lot of sense to go international, but like, have you ever felt that kind of guilt for, for not trying to make a difference from in, in Western Mass, for example? I don't know. Absolutely. You know, my uh, grandfather um, was born in Ukraine. His father was a rabbi, and uh, during a pogrom, his father was shot and the synagogue burned down, and he fled across Europe and eventually, uh, and he was um, he was bayoneted through the shoulder and he was put up in front of the firing squad, and uh, the rest of the people he was with were shot, but someone pulled him out at the last minute because he thought he was too young, and he eventually made his way to to America, and he. You know, thought it was the land of you know, the land of the American dream. He worked incredibly hard and got into an insurance company and rose up to a mid-level insurance company, and then was informed that he could never go any further because he didn't have Jews in management in uh, insurance companies at that time. And that, as I think about it, that was so deeply infuriating. And it surely infected him at some level, but he never stopped loving this country, deeply, deeply, deeply loving this country for the opportunity that it presented to him, coming from the background that he did. And he passed that love on to my father and he passed it on to me. And I've spent my whole career trying to serve people elsewhere in the world. And when I sat in that same desk in our first school in 2016, at five in the morning and watched the election results, I felt not what some of my friends were messaging about the need to leave the country. I felt a deep pull back to the country and a deep desire to get back to the American experiment, which is why I'm here today. Um, but I, you know, there's, you may have come across more broadly to your, to your point, uh, there's a movement called the effective altruism movement, which is trying to take a really rigorous, you know, sort of dispassionate analytical look at where can you, you know, spend your marginal dollar to have the, the great, you know, sort of 
take all uh, feeling out of it and just you know, where does your dollar have the most impact? I think that's a great intellectual exercise, but for us as individuals, for you personally, it's not about ethics. It's not about maximizing the cost-benefit ratio. It's about what draws you and what's, what's part of your story. I don't, I, I, I used to obsess a lot of the time about you know, what's the right impact, the right skill of where. If you are called to having impact you know, serving homeless people in Waterville, or you're called to serving people in Angola, you know, suffering from ter tuberculosis, they're both great. You know, I just worry more about where, what feels true to you and the experiences you want to have, rather than any sense of guilt about I should be serving people elsewhere. There's massive amounts of need, there's plenty of heartbreak in the world, and any of it deserves and needs your help, and don't worry about the, the, the impact you're not having by doing that. Because reality is, is we're, we have to trade off you know, 99 things for every one thing that we do, right? Yeah, yeah. You make a choice and you're, if you serve homeless people here, you're not serving some other problem here. So just, we have focus on the like, what fires you up, and don't worry about the what you're not doing. Yeah. Um, like sort of what I'm like hearing uh, from what you said was that you have like a fear of failure, right? And and I don't know, do you have like per, sort of a perfect? Are you sort of a perfectionist as well? So my question would be, um, after you sort of got over like, being afraid of failing and, and sort of wanting to do everything perfectly, every other decision you made after that, do you feel the same sort of like high stakes, even though you've already realized that you've gotten over that hump? Does, or do, does every single opportunity you have or, or a decision you make, you still have that sort of feeling of, like, I don't want to fail or I, or I really want to get this right, even though you've already proved to yourself that that's that not like a good thought process. Spot on, yeah. I haven't gotten over it. I think it's deeply human and natural to have a feel fair. I don't think I'll ever get over it. It's, I think that what's changed is that, you know, there's a saying I love, which is, sunlight is the best disinfectant. So before, I wasn't aware of or I wouldn't acknowledge how much that fear was driving my behavior and my decisions. And now I can see it. I see my fear for what it is. And by put, bringing it out in the light and saying, okay, I know I'm really afraid of my failure at this point. I'm not going to let it drive my decision. And so I'm actually going to lean into that fear, let it be there, and still going to do what I want to do. Because the fear never goes away. Whether it's you know, fear about you know, some life decision or fear about um, yeah, the, you know, whatever, you know, taking a test or giving a talk or whatever, the fear is going to be there. It's more what we do with the fear. And yeah, I, I still, you know, in, in work every day or every week, I still feel that fear and I just try and, you know, and still sometimes it, it drives my decisions, but I think it does less so now. Um, you talked about investors and how oftentimes there were a lot of frustrating moments regarding them. So I'm wondering how you've learned to balance the donor agenda with what you're hearing from people on the ground who are living and experiencing the things that you're trying to address. Yeah, and, and I mean to be clear, like there are the great people who work in on the fund giving side as well. The, but we're all shaped by our institutional incentives, and often the incentives, if you're an investor or a philanthropic foundation, are just very different from what the incentives are if you are trying to provide services and operate. Um, and as you say, the, the ultimate needs of the people on the ground. I think being, being the translator between the money and, and the recipients is just fundamentally hard. And you have to, you have to try to build trust and push back where you can, and then when you can, do the best you can. Um, it's, and sometimes uh, there are sometimes you can sort of cajole or convince you know those those with money to to, to shift things, and, and sometimes you lose and you just need to sort of adapt and still, it may not be perfect and it may be frustrating, but you sort of lose the battle that you still try to, try to
try to win them more and still just be patient and go on to the next phase. Um, and that's, you know, we, as I mentioned, we had a number of times where, you know, we spent a year working with an investor, getting everything ready, and then the last month they decide we're not, you know, we're not giving the money after all. But we survived. You know, we figured it out. It was really hard. Found other money, and sort of kept going. And so, you know, they continue to grow, continue to thrive despite that. Even though I wish, you know, wish things had played out differently. Um, you talked about how your resistance to pain um, kind of kept your body from functioning, but. Isn't that resistance and repression of pain? Doesn't that occur because you're so afraid of the pain will be debilitating and prevent you from doing what you want to do? So it's like a lose lose situation. So, how do you, and you mentioned that you have to kind of accept the pain, but in a way that it won't overwhelm you, but you didn't mention how you do that. So, that's something you can touch on. Um, yeah, great. I think you, you summarized really well there the paradox, which is that to feel less pain, to be less, have it affect your life less, you need to lean into it. It's, it's so deeply unnatural to us, right? Because we're so wired as creatures of the world, let alone humans, to want to, to be averse to pain, right? That pain is a signal of something we need to move away from. But the answer is we actually need to go in the opposite direction and we need to, to lean into it. And then by doing so, we, uh, we take off, it's, it's not that it's not there, so you think about this equation, right? The, the outcome isn't the pain. The pain is a fixed, right? The outcome is your level of suffering from it. Right, so it's, um, is a, as an analogy, on Saturday I went for a run and I broke my foot. Um, I managed to kick a log really hard. And, I, and this, this equation came into my mind. I said, there's no way, I can't prevent myself from being in pain. I've just broken a bone. But what I was able to do is observe my, the process that went through my mind. Like there's, there's a, and I can go on for a while, I've become deeply fascinated with the, the, the sort of state of the art of neuroscience on this. And what, what's happening is there is, there's a part of our brain that just receives the signals, right? Like something broken, bad, you know, alarm coming up into my brain. That I can't prevent. But what then I was able to observe happening is the other part of our, of our brain, which is, is basically driving thought and feeling, is there's all these narratives that start spinning up from it. What if this is more serious than I think? What if I'm going to be, you know, what if I'm going to be in pain and it won't be able to, to run again for a while? What if I won't be able to play in that basketball tournament? You know, I have a trip coming up to London. What if I'm affected by that? And I can't prevent those thoughts from coming up. I can't prevent those feelings from coming up. But what I can do is not grasp at them. I can't, I not give them power and I just sort of let them go. And then the, the pain is still there. Yes, I'm still walking around with my broken foot right now. But it doesn't, its power over me is gone because what, what captures, neurologically what captures our attention is the things that have the greatest force of feeling. And so there was fear coming up, but I didn't, I didn't sort of, I didn't allow the fear to build. I just said, okay, you know, I just fear of my, that having a problem with my foot, and it kind of dissipated, and then the, the power of the pain went away. So, to all your own to the question, like, what do you do? It's um, just finding, finding times to just be like, what, what has worked for me and, and, and other people that have had similar experiences, just finding time to be with yourself and your actual feelings and not giving them power. Um, it's in the, 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 really the only way to do that is to stop running around all the time. Um, and, you know, I, I basically work was a way for me to, to not be with my feelings. So I, I work less than I do. I, if I, you know, have free time, I don't just flip around on my phone and, and go on social media. I will go for, you know, quiet walks, I'll allow, like, quiet moments, and I get more attuned to what's going on um, inside me. And I'll actually, if I feel myself getting angry, I'll allow myself to get angry. If I feel myself feeling fear, as I mentioned, I'll allow myself to feel fear, and then it passes. Um, this is just a quick question going back to what you were talking about after Emma asked. Um, her question about, like, weighing, I don't remember exactly what it is, but, like, weighing, like, domestic versus international work. Um, and I guess 
I like you mentioned that you should like work on identifying what speaks to you the most and how that will help you be successful. But how do you weigh that with also like what you have the most like agency over? Because I feel like if something speaks to me, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to like be successful with it. But I were to just like I was thinking like the Israeli Palestine conflict, like I don't know anything about that in terms of like productive solutions. But that doesn't mean that I don't feel like very intensely that there's a lot going on there that like needs um, reconciling. Reconcil yeah. <laughs> um, and so I think like weighing that is also really important, like figuring out what you have the skills to be successful in, in addition to just what you're passionate at. So how do you balance that? Like, so I think that's an important distinction. Yeah, but also uh, I think that's right. But there's taking a topic we came in at the dinner. Um, First of all, you're not going to be successful. You're going to fail. Right? If you take that as a given, you're, you're going to fail. And secondly, you don't have anywhere that you have any skill or a way to contribute to the problem. And that's not that's not a, that's not an insult of you, right? I'm saying that you, I say like writ large, you are coming out of that was the point of my Namibia story is we come out of of undergrad and we actually don't have. You know, we are, we are built up to think that we do, but you don't. And that's, it's actually, again, another paradox. It's freeing to realize I'm going to fail, and I don't, I don't have that much to contribute right now, because it means, well, if I'm going to fail, I should probably just go and pursue the thing that is really firing me up and interesting me. And I'm going to go knowing that I'm probably going to struggle in this, and I'll learn and grow, and I'll start to build a skill set. And then I'll be able to apply it a little bit better and a little bit better. Now that's all in the context of there's a, a concept in education that you may have come across called the zone of proximal development. So if this is you and your ability level in a given area right now, you call it writing or whatever, the sweet spot to be in is some challenge if you want to go you know, work, in, you know, work in journalism and you know, write articles for the Wall Street Journal. You know, this what writing for the Wall Street Journal may be this. It's beyond your current ability level, but it's sort of one order of magnitude. If you said, I want to go write a, uh, you know, a textbook about theoretical physics, and you haven't studied theoretical physics, right? That's somewhere out here. And you're not going to get any value from doing this. You're going to really struggle at it. You're going to suck at it. You're going to fail, but you're going to fail in a way that's not actually growing you. You may you probably will fail. Your first article for the Wall Street Journal will probably be crap, and you'll fail at it. But because it's in the zone of proximal development here, you're growing because it's stretching you just enough that you are uh, you're you're growing from it. So you're, you're where I, I totally agree with your point about skill is you want to find something <coughs> here, um, but I wouldn't worry too much about what skills you do and don't have at the moment, because the, the main thing is that matters most is your potential. You, have the, you can build any skill you want right now. Does, if you majored in art right now and you're really interested in finance, you can learn finance. If you, you, know, if you are really interested in you know, education, you can go learn teaching, and it's um, just as long as you're, you're not taking on something too much, but that's the nature of entry level. Can I ask? Yeah. I guess I have more. I can just say. Um, I I mean, like to give an example, or for like I mentioned, I'm interested in criminal justice, um, and I think a lot of criminal justice initiatives are most productive when there are people who are like directly involved in the justice mm -hmm. system or like running them, and versus like me, who's coming from not. Very, like not really contact with the criminal justice system other than like working in systems but not like having lived experience in that and so like if I were to go and start an initiative I think it wouldn't be successful in a lot of ways not because I just don't have the skill right now but because 
I don't have that lived experience that makes me mm -hmm. someone who could contribute a lot to like that specific initiative, I guess. And that doesn't mean I can't contribute certain things and like add to change in that field, but just specific, there are like some better avenues, I feel like, than others. Absolutely, yeah, I think being really aware of context and yeah, that, you know, that, that's, a, that's a great place of humility to come from of, you know, I don't, I don't actually know, know what it's like to be screwed by the justice system. So I'm mean, sort of going to that eye open. And yeah, there's probably roles within criminal justice reform that I'm not well placed to play. And that even, even if you did really work hard at it because of your context and, and life experiences, you're not well placed for. But if you're passionate about it, there's plenty of other ways you can contribute. I have a, a friend who, has spent his career in healthcare, but he's very passionate about criminal justice reform. He had the same recognition you do. He said, I built a skill, you know, I have pretty good at fundraising, so I'm not gonna be on the front lines of these great nonprofits doing this work, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do fundraising for them, right? Or you can, you can find ways to contribute to those organizations that that different context that you have is, is, isn't an issue if you're, if you're passionate about that. So don't, don't let that, that right Humility scare you away from from contributing if that's something you're passionate about. Did you have one more question? You um, sure, sure. You're good, and then I think we're going to wrap up, and individuals can come and chat as well. So, yeah, um, I was just going to ask. So we have the circles over there. Um, do you think that? System or visualization is any different when it's writing an article or a theoretical physics textbook versus like development work? Um, in terms of you know, where, where you might fall in your, in your zone here? Um, I guess, or just how, what you think you would take on, given your experience. Yeah, and, and this concept applies to anything, right? It can apply to the piano or playing basketball or it, it, it can apply in, in a skill, right? Because of course, with development is such a massive, amorphous field. And within development, you have people that do finance and accounting, you have people that do communications, you have people that do field work, et cetera. So I think if you're interested in that and you're sort of wondering, like, all right, well, it's what's, what's outside my zone and what's inside my zone, I think you're thinking you're trying to boil it down more narrowly. Okay, I see an opportunity to intern for the World Food Program types of things I'll be doing that I'm looking for someone who's going to be doing media relations. The types of things that I'm doing, does that feel like it's, you know, way out here? Or does it feel like, okay, this is gonna stretch me and challenge me and I may fall on my face a couple of times, but it's, you know, I think, I think with a bit of, of effort and a few mistakes, I can, I can get there. I'm trying to try to narrow that scope down. Because are there places for anyone in this room within development that, you know, squarely within that, that zone of development? Absolutely, yeah. So your title on um, being a social entrepreneur, right? A serial social entrepreneur. You also define as being a social builder. And my takeaway on this is that as you're becoming a social builder, not to forget you, the individual. Mm -hmm and make sure that these, that you're learning both ways, right? So at di different moments in your talk, I was feeling depressed <laughs> at the failure part, but I'm also energized very much by this sense of we can become better, and in the process of that kind of reflection, we can build a better society. So I hope that many of you are able to leave with that. I'm sure you're able to leave with many thoughts and to join me in thanking So if you have additional, I told Oliver we try to hold to the hour and 15 because I know a number of you have to get to other commitments, but I'm happy, yeah, happy, to, happy to chat up and, here if anyone knows other, other thoughts. Bring on a few so. questions, yeah. yeah.